listen to the heartache, the laughter and the tears. Feel the call of the peace as our great elders dear. October 10th, 1914, to my dearest wife and companion. Good news and bad. As you know, I plan to take my traps and gear with me on the sternwheeler D.A. Thomas to Hudson's Hope. I have arrived, despite a few minor setbacks, which I will explain later. I am most certainly glad that they have put in the Dominion Telegraph a few years ago because I was able to contact the game warden, Ed Forfar, who was also the first policeman here, to discuss establishing my trap line. Mr. Forfar regaled me with tales of the history of this region and told me of Alexander Mackenzie, who in 1793 was the first to discover the area. Also, Simon Fraser, another great explorer who was responsible for building Rocky Mountain Portage in 1805, that being the old name for Hudson's Hope. This community may have been named after a prospector called Hudson, whom hoped to find gold here. Why, just last year, the first barge of coal, high-grade anthracite, was shipped out heading for the town of Peace River. Dear wife, I am in a land of history, and it is still being made. It's fur trading, mm -hmm. and then most of it was mines, coal mines. It was uh, Gethin coal mine, Gorski coal mine, Packwood's coal mine. There's so much history in here. Uh, it's from the Indians when I first came. Uh, there was uh, a few Indian tents on the riverbank, the first Indians I'd ever seen. There was no road across the river mm -hmm. for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, from There was trails to Mobley. Yeah. But, well, uh, didn't, isn't that what Mr. Peck used to do? He Wasn't he the ferryman? He was a ferryman yeah. for, uh, for a while, but there were other... Uh, was, um, fellow by the name of Art Alexander, he was a ferryman too. He built an ice bridge and he describes coming across that and it was really quite scary. But that, that was the way they crossed in the winter time and with the ferry boat in the summer, yes. Mm -hmm. Up until, well, 1964, that's when the bridge was built, yes. Yeah. The river actually was our life uh, 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 stream, really because we, we live by the river. We'll come up with the Hudson Bay boats when, when they came up about once a month, I think it was, in the summer. And then I came up on the little Weenus, little Hudson Bay boat to Hudson Hole. And it had, it was continued as a Hudson Bay trading post until 1955, when the Hudson Bay closed their store here. Summer 1915. To Constance, my fair lady, who I miss very much and think about often. Greetings from the village of Pooscoopy. I have just arrived here from Grand Prairie where my new traps and supplies are waiting at the train station for me. I trust you and my son are in good health and that everything is going well. I was fortunate enough to be traveling with a couple of men who knew this area very well, Mr. Hopkins and Mr. Trombley. A friend and fellow trapper introduced me to these rugged pioneers, Mr. Joel Walton. You may remember him from the time him and I trapped together on the Lone Prairie trap line. Mr. Frank Hoskins is a trader and storekeeper and he told me that his store is in a tent for now. He was bringing back some store goods and other needful items from the end of the steel in Grand Prairie. My dear wife, this country is filling up. They now have a post office and are building a bank of commerce, and they have a police station. I shall be home for Christmas for a short time, God willing, and we will be as one again, dear wife. My heart and my thoughts remain yours, Constance, and until we are together again, I am your loving husband, Jeremiah. Of course, I, I was also a waitress. I was waitress in the Hart Hotel. Uh, when the, it, it, that was in Poos. In fact, it was Poos was was the the, the seat of government here, because you couldn't get to uh, the rest of BC from this area. You had to go through Edmonton to get into into BC. You know. So this uh, Poos was the place, and that was where the government buildings were, and the government people, and the public works, and that. 
I don't know how to explain that in Pus. It was just, uh, but it was a very small place. In fact, it was more important really than Dawson Creek at that time because of the government situation, you know, the government buildings. And the liquor store was there too. <laughs> that was very important, especially years later on Alaska Highway. It was the only, only liquor outlet in the country. You know. Dawson Creek actually is, it started uh, where the bypass crosses the creek west of Dawson. That's where Dawson Creek was. Uh, supposedly the landowners in Poos, uh, in negotiating with the railroad, were, were so greedy that in the end uh, they, they were fooled and uh, the uh, uh, McKellers and some of these early pioneers made arrangements for the railroad to set their uh, station up in Dawson Creek. We brought the railroad on into Dawson Creek, That's my father and my uncle. And no electricity for the first part of my life in Poos. Mm -hmm. It was privately, it was private then, it wasn't BC Hydro, but it, it was a people by the name of Circe's had the power plant down there. And they had it in Dawson Creek too to start with. We had electricity in the old town from a private outfit. So of course when we come over here, the big outfit came in and the town moved. And they moved the whole town in 1931 when the railroad hit. They brought the co-op in. Now, but they would move it along the road and the farmers would come along and they'd tie their horses up and it, they had a winch. It was moved by a winch. It still is if you go to the cafeteria at the co-op. You'll yeah. see the same type of people there. And uh, it is a gathering point. But it was more so before. It had the credit union in it. And it was the big store. It was the big uh, shopping store in town. The do drop in received the very first license in the Peace River country in, I believe, 1936. And then in 36, when they got the liquor license, uh, you know, they expanded. And there were various other businesses, like a cab stand and a transport company. A bakery. And a bakery that were located in this building before it was named the Alaska Cafe. And but uh, shopping was uh, enjoyable in those days. Uh, we really enjoyed it. Too Saturday much. night was a big thing. You had time to go uptown and go shopping and meet people and, and uh, it, it was great. Well, it was a developing town. Uh, the most amazing thing was to find out that if you walk to the center of town, you must wear your gum boots. But don't expect to have two of them on by the time you got across the road. <laughs> The roads weren't paved to come to Dawson Creek. It was no. potholes and lots of potholes. Well, there was wooden sidewalks. There were still dirt roads. And with the gumbo on your shoes, you would slide off. So usually, I, I would just take my shoes off and go barefoot in the road. I mean, heck, it's easier to wash your feet than clean shoes, you know. It, it, was, it was just unbelievable. To my dearest wife and companion, I send you news of my journeys from Little Prairie. It was mostly just a stopping place where travelers can pasture their stock on the abundance of grass and water before moving on to wherever they were going. In uh, 1934, my parents moved the whole family to uh, Chetwin, where, which was actually named Little Prairie. My folks bought out an uh, established uh, little trading post. It was very small. And also in 1932, the post office, uh, the first post office was uh, made official in Chetwin, so uh, we had postal service at that time. There were no car roads, highways, that was horseback or sleigh or wagon. And um, my dad hauled the mail. He was the mailman from Chet Little Prairie to East Pine. And he went down on Tuesday and came back Wednesdays. Once a week we got our mail. Grizzly bears, I used to walk around all over camp. I used to come and eat there about 50, 50 yards away from my camp. Fall 1951. Now at least we have a good road from Dawson Creek and you can travel south to Prince George on rough trails, The rumor has it will soon be a highway. Over the hills to Morberley Lake where the natives believe a group of cannibals called Weetagoos live. Or you can go south to Lone Prairie, or east to where you are, my love, in East Pine. A friend and I drove north for a great adventure 
in the great Peace River country over the gravel heart highway between Prince George and, and uh, Dawson Creek. Way back, I guess it was the summer of 1955, bouncing around in our old pickup on the gravel, I stayed in Chapman, where there was um, the schoolroom, was uh, the schoolroom and the teach ridge attached. The My dad and Frank Oberly were the two that spearheaded the road from Chapman to Hudson Soap. They were the presidents of the Chamber of Commerce, and that's how we got it started. And you had to wait till freeze up and build an ice bridge and then have the exciting time of uh, when the ice was going out, the last load, you know, coming over the ice bridge with the water welling up all around and I mean, those kinds of things. My dearest wife, Constance, we need to hang on to our little piece of heaven. The Homesteading Act is bringing in people from all over the world looking for their peace. There is free land for those that want to put some sweat into the improvement of it. Every day there is more land advertised for settlers. Homesteading? Well, that's when you take a parcel of raw land and you got to clear, the, clear all the trees and break it and pick the roots and rocks and what have you. A lot of hard work. At that time, you could get a quarter section for $10. But the stipulations were you had to, within five years, you had to do, I think it was $1,600 worth of improvements. And some of it being, uh, I think, 20 acres had to be broke. You had to have a house on it that, and you had to live in it. You had to have dug out fencing, stuff like that. It was a homestead act at that time. But then you, what you'd call, prove it up. So in five years, you would own it. You could go in and uh, homestead another one. What brought me here, us here, was a full page ad in the, Ori in the Portland Oregonian newspaper of free land in British Columbia. Uh, in 1962, we was living in Idaho. We saw uh, an article in the paper that told about a family that was homesteading at Fellers Heights. We moved there with no job and no money, but we really had fun that summer because the, the berries was really good and the children was free to run and holler as they pleased. You were 10 years old, you, were, you could go trapping and we trapped squirrels. You already could set them out and you rode on horseback out into the wilderness and you bound a den and you could set the traps. And by the time you were 11 or 12, you could take 22 and go shoot squirrels. Before I went to school, I had gotten 124 squirrels, skinned them, put them on the boards, and sold them. And that's how I got some extra money to buy a coat, and to buy my winter boots, and to buy my gloves to go to school. That was very important because there was no money those days except what you made. And a lot of times we'd go and camp out for the whole entire summer. Dad would shoot a moose, Mom would make dry meat, uh, we'd pick berries. Uh, it was like a holiday. That was our holiday. Uh, never ate out in restaurants, there was none. You prepared all your own food. You, there was no McDonald's. Life was simple, but it was good. We, I don't know, we just worked on the homestead uh, after work when Dad would come home and uh, uh, everybody seemed to do everything together and everything went, went good, I guess, in them days. But when we milked the cows, we just put it in the shed and, and and behind the sun or something like that and stay cool. And then in the, in the summertime, well, yeah, one of the big treats was homemade ice cream, which we usually get on our birthdays. And uh, Dad would bring the ice out and we'd wash the sawdust off it and you had to chip it and everything with the axe. And a lot of you guys probably have made homemade ice cream and we all had to take a turn cranking. And, and uh, that was a big, big treat for, on birthdays. 
Constance, my dear wife, they are calling these years that we are in at the moment the years of depression, and it rings so true. The people on the farm are doing okay food-wise, but the townspeople are the ones that are lacking. Who would ever figure that in this land of plenty you would find rationing? Like I said, it was happy, and for, uh, for kids, you know, it was, it was tough. It was a depression time, and, uh, but I don't remember that at all. It, uh, it, uh, we always, like I said, had plenty to eat and played ball. Well, we, we had one horse. And uh, in the spring, my dad, he went and traded that horse off to get a garden spot plowed. So we had a garden spot and no horse. <laughs> well, that's the way it goes. I remember I had about six bucks left in my pocket when I got here. So here I was, I hunted lots, really. I was a good hunter, too. And that's how we fed our family, the moose meat and potatoes, <laughs> along with the other thing. It'd be potato, potato soup, potato hotcakes, potatoes, potatoes, because she made us a different many ways, and that, and of course we eat everything because I mean, what else, what else you can eat? Eh? I mm -hmm. mean, there was nothing. You couldn't buy nothing. Nobody had any money, and I mean, uh, you couldn't afford to buy anything. Eh? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. She was pretty. She was pretty rough. Pretty rough. Old hungry thirties, I'll tell you. Wheat there once we had nothing until father got back from town. It was pretty hard up. Them days. Working in the bush and go there and trap and all that stuff, they keep me going in the morning. Yeah, yeah. That was, you know, we had lots of fun in the winter too, even if it sometimes went down to 72 degrees below Fahrenheit. Oh. I remember that. Nobody went to school. We hardly went out at all, and you had to just dress really warm in the house because even the old log houses weren't all, all that hot. You stuck pretty close to the heat, big barrel heater that we had there. We even had the water, or it was so cold there, we even had to have our fuel oil in a container ahead of time before we used it to put it in. Because it would come out of the barrel like molasses when it was 30, 40 below. So. It was cold. We had this barrel stove and, and uh, the kitchen stove to keep us warm. But then, of course, by that time we had attained a bear robe or two, and Dad did have a buffalo robe kept us warm at night. We had to put the bear robe underneath us and the buffalo robe on top to keep warm. So everything froze solid all in the morning. It was a matter of getting thawed out first and then carrying on. Yeah, but then there was no water. You had to melt your, in the wintertime, melt your own snow. There was no running water. There was no electricity. There was outside Biffy with a, a Eating catalog for paper. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, you didn't sit out there very long and read a story. I'll tell you, forty <laughs> below. <laughs> and you remember in the years when you used to save all of your woolens, like mm -hmm. when the wool socks couldn't be mended anymore, they were saved, and the, and the men's long underwear, when it was totally Catch worn the, out, patched to death. <laughs> The, well, you would save all the woolens and then they would send them out to, was it Regina? Somewhere in Saskatchewan. Yeah, somewhere in Saskatchewan. It was a, like what we would say a recycling depot now, but they, they took these woolens and recycled it and made blankets. A horse and cutter in the wintertime. A cutter is a small, dad made it, it was a small wooden box on two light runners. Um, so it would slide along in the snow and we had a single horse pull that. So dad would bring the horse and, and hook the horse up to the cutter in the morning. We'd be all dressed and come out, get in to the cutter. We had a rabbit robe made out of rabbit skins sewn together and covered with a, a wool covering that mom had made. And um, dad had a hot rock that he a big hot rock that he would put in the bottom of the cutter to keep us warm. And with and on the bottom of the cutter inside was straw. And then he had a tarp over that straw. And he'd put the rock in the center of that, cover it with the rabbit robe. The warmth, you could feel the warmth under that rabbit robe. And we picked up kids along the way to school. We we'd end up start out with two of us, but we'd end up with six of us in there. I remember in the winter time. We put our lunch kits out in the little cloakroom we had, and uh, it was so cold in the wintertime that our lunches would freeze. 
you know, we bring them back in to eat them. And we'd have to wait for a while before you couldn't even bite them. They were frozen salt. You know? <laughs> get a strap or disobey the teacher. You could possibly get a strap or you could stand at the board and write 500 lines. I, I shall obey my teacher or something like this. And my mom got sick, so we had to quit. Look after my mom. I went to school now and then. We, we we used to miss a lot of school because the roads would be too bad or too much, too many snowbanks. You know, there's no there was no road plow being done then. Those days, Rolla School was the first uh, high school uh, around, and a lot of people came from different areas and stayed with people in the Rolla district and went to school at Rolla for their high school. Spring 1943. A letter to you, my darling Constance, about my travels and how my concern for you and the children journey with me. I trust this letter finds you and the boys well, and I can happily report that this last season's trapping was very good. But unfortunately, because of the war, fur prices are still down, just like the last four years. But any money coming in is good. So here I am in muddy, hectic Dawson Creek. I was told that about four years ago a large group of refugees from Czechoslovakia settled around here, Tom's Lake, I think, and doubled the population of the area. They are called Sudetens. 1939, that's when the Sudetens came in from Czechoslovakia because of the persecution by uh, Hitler when he overran Czechoslovakia. They, most of them settled in in the area just a few miles north and west of Swan Lake in an area that we called Gundy. There was a Gundy ranch that was owned by the CPR and the CPR in turn had turned the ranch over to the uh, Canadian government to accept the uh, Sudeten immigrants. So this would have been in 1939, and we had an increase in our school enrollment from these students. And it was quite an education talking to them, learning about where they came from and how things were in Europe. Uh, I came to uh, the Peace River country in uh, 1939 in June as a young boy, my parents. They had been involved in the Sudeten land of Czechoslovakia in the anti-Nazi movement and we were in fact refugees and we came to what was then Tupper uh, and uh, later became a Tom's Lake settlement. The Canadian government had set a regulation that for anybody that for this group to come in you had to have fifteen hundred dollars per family. Now, 1938, 1939, it was spring of 1939 we came. Um, that was a lot of money. It bought you a farm, a whole farm. But the money was turned over to the railway company. The railway companies had organizations to look after immigrants. They controlled the money. So, in fact, these people had no money except what was doled out uh, through the CPR people. See in Saskatchewan, some of them were there. So when we came over in 39, there's quite a few families that just couldn't put up with that type of life, the life because most of them were city people, okay? None of them were really farmers. Very few were that farmers. That immigrated. We weren't farmers. We were all professional people or in the in industry. So a lot of them couldn't handle that. So then the, the CPR, who was the in charge of our colonization here, they were able to find jobs for these people in Eastern Canada, like Toronto, Hamilton, Montreal, into the war, and put them in the war factories, okay? So they were back in the city, and at least, and they also had jobs. A lot of them couldn't handle the country. So you uh, country have no land. idea how many people? Well, we, when, we, when we all arrived in 39, there was over 500 bodies. Actually, that settlement had more people than Dawson Creek at that time in 39. It's hard to... No, I didn't to grasp that, yeah, mm -hmm. but I think we had more people in Tom's Lake at that time than the population of Dawson. 
Local businesses are thriving with new ones setting up just about every day. It seems like everyone is working. I have heard that there is a large group of Negro soldiers stationed here, but they are restricted to their camps and not allowed to fraternize with the town folk. Strange, isn't it? I can't recall ever having seen a Negro before and would like to. Please tell the boys that I miss them and we'll see them both soon. Until I return, Constance, know that I miss you, I love you, and pray for you and remain your loving husband, Jeremiah. When the war come along during the hungry 30s, that changed everything. Eh? It made work, the men went to the war. Things kind of loosened up. But before that world war, times went up. And the American army came in. They needed a, a route to protect Alaska. When the Japs bombed Pearl Harbor, they upset our thinking about a great many things, including Alaska. From Alaska, the Aleutian Islands stretched out invitingly toward a shrewd and daring enemy. The great Japanese air and naval base at Paramushiro was only 750 miles from Atu. Atu was only 1,200 miles from the mainland of Alaska. The Canadian government had already carved out a series of five airports between Edmonton, Alberta and Whitehorse, Yukon Territory. And there were other fields in Alaska between the Yukon border and Fairbanks. With Canada's consent, the United States War Department decided to build a military highway from Rails End at Dawson Creek, Columbia, to Fairbanks, Alaska, to link up and supply these airfields and to provide emergency access to Alaska for troops and material. So they uh, came into Dawson Creek via the little piece of road in between Grand Prairie and Dawson Creek. Well, Dawson Creek um, suddenly just, uh, it was kind of a little one horse town and it suddenly just boomed overnight. Just the American Army just took over and there were just people everywhere. Can you imagine a little town of... 500 population and overnight actually, you might say it grew to 12,000. Can you imagine that? Yeah. I can't. And bingo! We got a road, we got a good road. And then they started building the Alaska Highway and there was a tremendous influx of soldiers into the area. Well, I can remember standing at the corner of the Dawson Hotel when they were first starting to build this, when it did get to town, is the convoys. And I recall the soldiers on the street and looking at all these military vehicles and, you know, quite in awe. Of course, being from the sticks like I was, everything <laughs> was awesome to me. I seen these doggone guys, they were packing pistols as big as themselves. Here was the Yankees in there. And when they came in, we were out in the trap line. Mm. And when we come in the Dawson, here was every soldiers all over the doggone place. Brown Station was up here. That's where the American Army was when they were here. Yeah, well. That's what originally started up there. Was the Ameri where that's where they had their big camp, their base camp. As the American soldiers came in, they came in very, very quickly, and they were just as shocked because most of them were young boys, many, many, many from the deep south, mm -hmm. who had never seen snow. The Negro people, the boys, they had separate, they weren't allowed to associate with the white guys in those days. And I remember my sister-in-law and I were going to bowl in the bowling alley with these boys and two MPs came in and said to these guys, what the hell do you think you're doing? You don't do that. You don't, you're not supposed to bowl with white women. So they had to get out. And in the 1940s, I was six, five and six years old, eh? And I was living there when they dug the, the, the pipeline in for the water line that still served Dawson Creek. Mm. The army was there, there was a whole bunch of army soldiers and equipment digging the, the trench. And as a kid, I was down there watching them, man. Mm -hmm. And there were a couple of fellas there, and the, uh, this one fella says to me, hey boy, he says, you all got any chicken, any fried chicken up there? Because he could see my grandma's chicken walking around him. Mm -hmm. So I, I wasn't sure what he meant, but I went and talked to my grandma and she said, well, 
maybe what I'll do is I'll just catch a couple and cook them up and you can take them down. So I took them down in this little wagon, I put a kid here. So they put them in this little wagon and pulled them down and they give me 20 bucks for it. You know, that's a lot of money in those days. But that sticks in my mind, you know. Here was a person from another country mm -hmm. I never met before and interacting and almost getting into the chicken business. There was a shortage of everything. We had rations. Uh -huh. You could only get so much tea, so much coffee, so much sugar. Uh, we always liked their uh, uh, chocolate bars. They were very great at giving out chocolate oh. bars. They came out this one day and there's a couple of guys that were trying to tell my dad that that would be a good truck to have on the farm. Well, we couldn't quite see what it was on the farm, but anyway, they were all there. <laughs> And they insisted to my dad, maybe, you know, we could bring one of them up. We'd just put, take it someplace, you know, and hide it until after the, after this is all over, and then you'd have a truck. Mm -hmm. Oh, Dad said, I don't think we need one of those very bad. <laughs> so anyway, we laughed and talked about it, and, and a few days later, why out they come with a tank. Oh. And so this one fellow said, well, you don't want the truck, we thought maybe we should bring a tank. <laughs> we were the canteen, a club towards the the army, and uh, they'd have dances there, and then, uh, a beer parlor type of thing. And we we all had GI keys. And these guys would leave their vehicles, bring their vehicles down, and every every key fit every vehicle. So we'd drive them around. <laughs> you know, when they when they uh, dance, we never get caught. The older uh, people, if they consumed any alcohol, it was outside, and they were able to smoke inside. Now it's just the opposite. There were so many people in this town that the do drop in pub was filled to capacity every night and it was so cold that they would start campfires on the street to warm up in anticipation of being able to return to the pub to have two more beer just in order to be kicked out the back door again. We hauled coal out of Hudson Hope for the U.S. Army, the Canadian Army, the Air Force. Up, we hauled it up the highway for a number of years. Our job was just to get supplies up the highway you got so much a mile per ton, from food to cement to uh, culvert material on the road. It really opened up the piece here then. On February 13th of uh, 1943. And it was a nice, it was kind of a Chinooky day, day like. And My dad was just coming home from work at six o'clock. Does he come? up on top of the hill to come towards our place, he saw this fire. And this building was burning, it was an old livery barn. In those days, everybody turned out to see a fire. Mm -hmm. So we run this half mile through the field down to the fire. Our dad was uh, having a haircut and the story is told that he uh, went to assist the volunteer fire department. I'm in Carwango. And the explosion happened. see the box cars, you know, just like they put a string of them nickel box of matches out there, probably the first flight I ever had in this country. So then someone came running out and saying that this, everybody get out of here, there's dynamite in there and it's going to blow up. So I guess we all scattered, I, 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 most of us anyway, I, I, don't, I remember I did. Well, they stored the dynamite, but they did, they stored the caps there too. And that's what caused the explosion in this barn, you know. Mm -hmm. Everything went flying and there was a stove sitting on the platform at the station and apparently it was picked up and thrown and, and uh, no, it was really a mess. And uh, our dad was killed. The uh, U.S. Army assumed responsibility for his death and uh, after several months and a couple of hearings, uh, she received a small uh, settlement, uh, which was uh, for her uh, then being a widow at this point. And come down and landed and started to get the hell out of there, running, you know. We laid out and played out, and I sat down and started looking at it. My buddy was on the car, he came along, he said, this is where you got to. He said, wasn't there a hell of a bang? He said, you bet you was. 
and all that was left was the, the co-op store. And then there was about four big chimneys stuck up there. They just looked like totem poles. And all the rest of it was right flat. As far as how many people got killed in that, I think there was about three civilians. But I think probably there was a lot of American soldiers because they sent them in there to try and find out what was causing the fire and put the fire out. And I mean, uh, they were just there and they were gone. They never found them again. You recall when we came here last year and how surprised we were at how the town had exploded. The constant the town actually did explode not too long ago. In February as a matter of fact. A good thing the army was here and all their manpower. They helped a great deal by organizing the cleanup and maintaining order I am told. Things have sure changed in this country and I'm feeling a mite crowded in nowadays. But I realize that for you and the kids, things are a lot better than they were. Roads all over the place. Trains now and even aeroplanes. It's getting so a fellow feels rushed, not like the days when I walked or rode a horse or paddled a boat to get where I wanted to go. This here road they're built goes all the way to Alaska. This is where I feel I can find employment. Finally, on the 20th of November, 1942, eight months after the first troops plunged into the northern bush, the pioneer road from Dawson Creek to Fairbanks was officially opened. Following closely behind the soldiers who built the pioneer road came civilian contractors to turn it into a permanent all-weather road. They established their own camps and repair facilities at vantage points along the route. As ice formed in lily pads on the rivers, strange new patterns in steel rose against the cold northern sky. Suspension bridge. Originally the army brought it from Somewhere down by Seattle. It had collapsed down there too. <laughs> Holy. And they brought it up and it was a major link on the Alaska Highway. It was just temporary population. You know, I mean, the, the army pretty well disappeared and the, and the army workers, the, but they disappeared. They were only here for, I don't know, eight months or so. But it was a start. The highway. Well, that was a, a wonderful thing. It, it, it made you feel like you were more part of part of BC, or, which we were. We, we became part of BC. Then before the Peace River was, uh, nobody heard about it. When I drove it there in, in uh, the early 50s, why, you'd think they either followed a, a snake through the woods or a drunk one way or the other, but they followed the streams. But it, uh, it was something out of this world that you won't forget it. I actually went back in the, uh, when I first started in 56, the roads were fair, were wide, eh? and the uh, army, army maintained them as all. Well. Uh, the talk of the, uh, of uh, the railroad coming in from Vancouver, from Prince George, the BC Rail, the Hart Highway, another link to the coast. It all helped to bring our uh, Peace River block onto the world markets. Well, my dear, the war has come to an end and the rationing is over. It was a hard time for all concerned, but we made it through. There are now more people arriving from Eastern Europe, German-speaking Sudetans, with terrible stories of the war over there. And after Hitler lost the war, then the Czech threw some of the uh, Sudeten people out of the country. And the ones, like my mother, was a widow with two children. We were expendable, you know. And then we didn't know whether we would end up in East Germany or West Germany, but we were put on trains, and then we were just unfortunate enough to end up in East Germany. And so we lived in this small place for two years until, and in that same apartment, a man lived who, who kind of um, uh, helped people cross the border and showed them where to go. We had to, of course, leave everything behind, and we didn't really have that much. 
and <clears throat> and just looked like we were going for a um, afternoon stroll, right? I just remember walking and then having to crawl through a uh, wheat field. And as we came out of the uh, the um, wheat field, here there were soldiers. And I remember how scary that was. And they were actually not Russian soldiers. They were German, um, oh, German soldiers in the Russian army. And, uh, and, and we thought, well, that's it. We're being stopped. Either one or two of the soldiers had been in, um, in the army and were actually prisoners in Canada during the war. And they were treated so well. So then mom showed them the papers of, um, that we got from, um, uh, up here. from up here, from, from my uncle, that we had to, uh, that we were going to Canada and the trips paid for and all that. Um, I guess that they felt sorry for um, a mother with her two kids and they let us go. I came here in 1952 and the reason came I was born and raised in Eastern Europe, in Eastern Germany. It was once part of Prussia, of Greta Prussia. All the people at that time, to make it short, they've been expelled. And since I came from a family of farmers for several hundred years, my folks were always farmers. I came, I choose Canada as, as one of those destinations to seek a new home to be a farmer. I uh, ended up in Toronto and I read, one day I read a little periodical in the paper and I uh, was looking for a job for, for a farm occupation, uh, occupation of some kind. And I read, and I don't think it was more than a, than a couple of inches wide and maybe five inches long, it was highlighted for the wonderful last pioneering country in Canada. And since it says you don't need no money, you didn't no need to, uh, uh, nothing, you just willingness to work and, and you became, can become wealthy and rich. My dear wife, I just found out that they are going to build this big dam up here at Hudson's Hope. It is disappointing to realize that that beautiful river where we took that memorable canoe trip will be gone, as well as all those acres of fertile river land. But that is progress, and the need for electricity is great. And back in 55, my brother and I, we started a, uh, taking river trips up the Peace River with a boat. So we carried that on until we got settled out by the WRC Bennett Dam. And, uh, it was a great time to go, because the only place in North America where you can cross through the Rocky Mountains by, by boat. The old Winsk, Winsk used to come up with freight, but there wasn't too much otherwise boats. By the starting of the dam, there was no road. And they built ice bridge, and I remember that. That I was still in school when that happened too. And then later they they did the the dam thing. <laughs> when I was working on the dam, or not on the dam, but hauling cement to the dam, I watched the penstocks being put up as we hauled the cement in. And then I watched the lake flood, and everything changed. One of the amazing things was that the school changed from a, from a one-room school to a student body of 907 pupils that first a couple of years of the building of the dam. We did have property above the dam that we lost. They uh, flooded. They gave us some mountainside that uh, really wasn't of very much value. Well, they, if we could have yeah. all just stuck together, stuck together. Mm -hmm. nobody sold yeah. till everybody mm -hmm. sold. Mm -hmm. They got all the property for just about nothing. Yeah. And then we had the tours that were going, they were going to, uh, for the, up to the dam, the, to, uh, the, when the dam went in. Yeah, in fact, my oldest son worked there, at the dam. Spring 1982, Tumbler Ridge. A letter to my dear wife Constance from another frontier, Tumbler Ridge a place of such beauty that it takes my breath away and makes my eyes mist over. I am parked on a ridge overlooking the new town site and the air up here in this high mountain valley is so fresh and crisp and the views are so clear that I can see where they are building the town 
and the two coal mines. Somewhere down there amidst all the construction and hectic activity of the Ant Lake workers and their machines is our oldest boy and his family, waiting for my arrival. It will be so good to see them again, and I only wish you were here with me. I find myself looking at the countryside with different eyes, my darling. Eyes that no longer view it as a challenge or as a source of revenue, but as something to just look at and enjoy. I can sit back now and say to myself that I've traveled those trails and looked over those hills and worked hard to make a living from those forests. And I am satisfied that I did my best, Constance. I am coming home. My wandering has ended. The only road I travel now is with you, my love. I return soon. Dear heart, look for me before the next moon fall. Jeremiah. We, we came out here one time and uh, we was, uh, was going to lease this land here. Okay. We didn't even know there was going to be a tumbler ridge and uh, was going to raise big horses. So we put in for it. We sent to Prince yeah. George and, and put in for the whole property. We marked it all out. And it came back and they said, uh, if, if the town, they were planning a town in the fall, and if the town didn't go, then we had first dibs. We had first dibs at the land, but the town went. And of course we thought, why would they build a town right out in the middle of nowhere? Like, it didn't <laughs> well, make sense still, to you, us. You know, you just drop out of the, over the big hill there. And yeah, we were up on the ridge there. there. Town down here. Yeah. And it was just beautiful, you know, the grass was just lush all down along the rivers. Until we were inside, yes, we were here uh, in, in this September of 1982. And they found that some of the families had come up here with their husbands because they were working in the construction area. So they had a, a makeshift school built uh, in the Kilbourne construction site, which was off out of town here. First, there was no accommodation for teachers, and then second, there was no accommodation for anybody because none of the houses were finished yet. <laughs> and, uh, no, the first year we were here, the town was basically completely built. As you look at it now, there are really hardly any new homes, but none of them were occupied. They didn't get them finished. And so uh, uh, we sat in a house of empty houses, in a town of empty houses. A lot of things about us that was new. Uh, we were working in, a, in, a, in a, the mining industry at that time. Uh, we were the highest paid people in Canada, mm -hmm. per capita. We were opening up the largest open pit mine in North America. Uh, we were shipping our coal by electric rail, something that had never been done before. Uh, a large workforce at Quintet, I think there was times when we had in the area 1,600 employees. Mm -hmm. And it was a difficult thing to do to have a social community because a lot of people came with the expectation of staying two years and then moving on. So they never really felt that this was their home. Right. Uh, and then you find somebody who's been there for 10 years, you say, how come? <laughs> because <laughs> Tumblr was such a say. nice place to be in. It's a tough life being a miner. Not just anybody can be a miner. It's got to be, uh, it takes a certain amount of toughness. And these people in Newfoundland that had been working in mines, and uh, it was a natural fit for them. Uh, most of them, you know, their heart is in the West now. Mm -hmm. uh, their love will always be Newfoundland, of course, and why wouldn't it be? Mm -hmm. But uh, the West has been good to a lot of us. Like our girls say, they're glad they're not, their grandmothers were the pioneers they didn't want to be, you know. We start really hard, but we made it. We made it. We made it. Mm. We were really pioneers, you can say. My darling Jeremiah, I find myself putting pen to paper as I reminisce about the years gone by at East Pine. When I was by myself, I counted the days and prayed that you would be returned to me the candle continuously in the window. And as we were blessed with children and as they grew up, I yearned for your return and safekeeping. I remember the nights that you were not there to hold me, my darling, though I knew that you were out providing for our survival in this harsh land. May this letter find you on the last leg of your journey as you stop in Tumblr Ridge to see our oldest son, wife and children. My undying love travels with you, my dearest, awaiting 
You're returning to my side as always, your dear wife and companion constant. Light has grown dim, but it's the color of peace.